Uh, I'm Ted Perillo from the Information Security Office. It's an immense pleasure to present this workshop. With me, I have three colleagues from Stanford. Amir Barmani, he's the R&D lead at Stanford Center for Genomics and Personalized Medicine and a genetics lecturer. I also have Arashi Alavi, software researcher and developer at the Stanford Center for Genomics and Personalized Medicine. And I also have Elizabeth Lee from the University Privacy Office, which I'm gonna pass a, a presentation on to her so she can say a couple of words. Yep, thank you so much, Todd. This workshop is to help those of you who have interest in healthcare mobile apps to learn about how to secure personal health data, especially if you've been working with COVID-19 data that you're capturing, this workshop is really for you. Also, for those of you who are interested in learning how to de-identify time series data using algorithms, our resident computer science experts here have tackled the super challenging question of de-identifying COVID-19 data. Amir and Arash, thank you so much for your willingness to impart your knowledge and your expertise, and I'm gonna turn over our audience to you. Did we lose the audio? Right. On no, it's them? good. You know, just, okay, just you know, that on you. Sorry. Great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Ted, for this kind introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Amir Bamani with my colleague Arash. Uh, we are here to present uh, mobile penetration testing and de identification for digital healthcare apps. So here's the outline. We first talk about briefly about our platform, Personal Health Dashboard PhD. Then we are going to cover COVID 19 case study. And we are going to talk about security and privacy in healthcare apps around uh, security and privacy threats, goals, standards, and also uh, penetration test frameworks. Also, we're going to talk about mobile healthcare app penetration test around data storage, authentication, authorization, mobile network, and platform APIs. Also, tampering and reverse engineering on apps. And also, we're going to talk about program static and dynamic analysis. And eventually, we're going to talk about mobile security framework, MOVASF. So before we just, let's start this, yes, you know, please go ahead and uh, scan this QR code, uh, use the camera on your phone and answer this question. You know, we're interested to know about your major field of study and research. You have two minutes. Thank you. While everyone is doing this, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions, please uh, put your questions into the chat. We're going to try to answer the questions as we go along. So uh, put your questions there. And also to encourage those of you who are in the workshop and have questions or want to make comments, um, I'll be monitoring those as well with Todd and uh, we will be having a raffle prize at the end for, for folks names and so um, be it, if you would like to participate, we would really encourage your active participation. All right, I think, you know, uh, we got, you know, really pretty good range of, you know, audience here. We have 32%, uh, around 32% uh, around uh, Cyrus security, also 32% around biomedical data science. And we have also computer scientists and folks with engineering background, uh, non-CS. So another question here, uh, please go ahead. This is around uh, your level of technical ability, you know, uh, with respect to uh, cybersecurity, please go ahead and uh, 
uh, answer this question. Since we have uh, so many developers, 44% changing. <laughs> and, uh, all right. All right. Great. Um, so let's start the presentation um, with uh, variable technology as Many of you may know a variable technology brought some incredibly uh, positive changes to healthcare industry. For example, our lab, Snyder Lab, in 2017 uh, was the first team to show that with uh, collecting heart rate from these variable devices, we can detect infectious diseases at earlier stages. Since then, we have been working on creating a platform which is scalable, secure, and interoperable. This platform called PhD. This is a 40,000 foot overview of the system. One of the unique features about a PhD is the fact that we are using a, pri a shared privacy and security model. So what we do is that basically we pull this variable data at the phone level, historical real time, everything pulls at the phone level. We de-identify, we apply differential privacy methods on the data, de-identify, remove all the PHI information encrypt it and send it to the back. And we're gonna talk a bit about this you know, in the next uh, slides. Here is a case study around uh, uh, PhD. And this paper got accepted recently by, uh, by uh, Nature Biomedical Engineering. It's gonna be out hopefully by the end of November or early December around uh, uh, early detection of COVID-19. And this is the front end of our system, my PhD that help us to securely collect historical and real-time data. Also, it helps participants to visualize and monitor their health data at different resolutions. But what is the challenge? The challenge is that you know, once you're done with your study, you have to share your data with other researchers so that they would be able to reproduce your results. But the challenge here is the fact that you know, around this data sharing, studies show that six days of step counts are enough to uniquely identify you among 100 million participants or other people. So what should we do here? For instance, I donated in two weeks of my data to a study and also, you know, I tested positive. Then an auxiliary data set, let's say for instance, Fitbit would be able to re-identify me. So here's another question for you. How would you de-identify variable data? You have uh, some options here, shifting dates, add fixed noise, add random noise, change time, or depends on the application. Please, you know, answer your question and answer this, you know, send us your answer and, you know, we're going to talk about it in the next slides. Yes, 23% so far shifting dates. We have 36% add random noise, uh, 30 around 29% around depending on the application and 6% around change time. All right, um, so here is one of our algorithms that designed and developed by Mong Wang in our team. On the top plot you can see here uh, that shows the difference, the, heart rate difference with respect to the baseline. So we first find your baseline and then we calculate the difference of that particular day with respect to the heart rate, resting heart rate. Here it shows that it, whether it's going up and down. 
What's important is that is actually here is missing. But what's important for us is actually those days, the period that the resting heart rate elevated continuously. For instance, here we see that for several days, the resting heart rate elevated. So, uh, you know, this is actually a standardized, but if you use cumulative sum and add up these differences, then it will create these beautiful bumps, which of course we don't want to see a lot of them, but this shows that the infection, you know, most probably is related to the infection and, you know, we want to capture these bumps. So now the first thing that we want to do is that for this algorithm, we want to apply, uh, shift the dates. So I want to go with some numbers, let's say 2,090 days, which change it to the future. Let's see what would happen. So as you can see here, everything shifted to 2026 and everything, the result is identical. The algorithm very well tolerated this change here, right? So this is the first one. Now, what we did also, we applied some privacy noises. We added a random value between minus five to plus five to average heart rate per minute. So basically here you can see we ran this five times. You can see it slightly changing, but it's still the big bump is there and the algorithm tolerated this. So uh, this is another one that we tested. One more, uh, another noise that we tried here, it was swapping hours. We tried to swap hours, like we are like 2 a.m. with 3 a.m. consecutive hours, uh, four with five, six with seven and so on and so forth. Again, you can see that still the algorithm can tolerate this uh, noise here. So we combined them all together and you can see that uh, again for this particular user, uh, actually the accuracy is still, is still the same and you know, it can act, you know, it can tolerate these noises. So bottom line, as you, a lot of you pointed out, 32% of saying that depending on the application is that the main reason that we want to share the data is basically around reproducibility. And as long as you can, you know, uh, your algorithm can tolerate these noises, then you, you should apply all these different noises to your algorithm. And, you know, you don't need to be worried about other folks' algorithms. And if they want to access to your raw data, then please send them to IRB or DRA so, so that they can take care of it. So now I want to ask my colleague Arash to come and talk about security and privacy in healthcare mobile apps. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Amir. Uh, so in next slides, we'll talk about the security and privacy in healthcare mobile applications. Um, so let's uh, start with this question. Uh, which industry do you think is today the number one target for cyber attacks? Again, you have one minute, please uh, go ahead and scan the QR code or use the URL. It might be an easy one, but let's see what you think. Right, so far 56% healthcare. So we'll see the answer shortly. Right, that's right. So 54% healthcare. So as many of you pointed out, the answer is healthcare. So uh, nowadays, every now and then we hear that another uh, healthcare data breach affected hundreds, thousands, or millions of users. So only last year, data breaches and ransom attacks cost the healthcare industry almost $4 billion. So a specific example of wearable companies is Garmin that they had just a ransom attack two months ago, and they were asked to pay the $10 million for the ransom attack, basically for the decryption keys. So that being said, in terms of mobile healthcare applications, we have different types of mobile healthcare apps. The first category is health commerce apps. So it largely consists of pharmacies or medical companies uh, selling uh, products or uh, for refilling uh, prescriptions and so on. 
The second category is medical and wearable device apps, for example, Fitbit or Garmin or uh, Dexcom, these uh, wearable companies that collect different types of uh, wearable data, such as heart rate, steps, sleep analysis, or glucose values. Um, so my PhD falls in this category of apps. And uh, the third one is telemedicine and patient engagement, uh, which is, these are for uh, mainly the uh, evaluation or uh, the diagnosis or treat the patients remotely or for the scheduling online appointments and so on. And finally, we have tracking apps, kind of new types of apps, for example, COVID-19 tracking, uh, which is uh, for uh, basically uh, identify and track and uh, notify the users about any risk or the quarantine status and so on. Uh, so here, as an example, to just uh, show you the rapid acceleration of mobile healthcare applications, uh, back in 2019, the percentage of patients using telehealth applications was around 11%, but uh, it increased to 46% in uh, April 2020. So as the mobile healthcare industry is evolving, is constantly evolving, uh, the security and privacy issues and vulnerabilities also continue to grow fast as well. Uh, so in a very recent study uh, that just got published a few weeks ago, penetration testing on 100 mobile healthcare applications using the OVAS security guideline that we'll talk about it later, found very serious vulnerabilities in many of these mobile healthcare applications. So for example, 91% of apps fail cryptographic tests or 85% of COVID tracking apps leak some sort of data. So these are really interesting uh, results showing the importance of penetration testing because that's the only way that you can find out these potential vulnerabilities. So if you are more interested, you can check out the Inner Trust security report on these uh, 100 mobile health care applications, penetration testing results. So now we want to start talking about the security and privacy threats, what are the goals and what are the options, basically methodologies that you can use to create secure apps. Uh, but before we start the discussion, let's go over this question and see what do you think, which one of these security and privacy threat or defense the mobile application is not the major attack surface. So that means that somewhere else is, is the major point to do this attack. But for the other four options, the mobile is the uh, major attack surface. So again, you have one minute. Please scan the QR code. In next slide, we will talk about the uh, attack surface on mobile applications. So hopefully it will help to find out the answer and then we will see the answer to this question. Still a few seconds. So far, unintended permissions is the first one. Now it changed. Right. All right, twenty nine person unintended permission. So we'll see the answer shortly after the next slide. So speaking of the mobile attack surface, this is a global view of the mobile attack surface. So these are the major segments that the security and privacy concerns need to be considered basically in any mobile application development. So first of all, we have data address. We need to make sure that there is no credential or any sensitive information stored in plain text. So we need to have all uh, fully encrypt encryption using, for example, Keychain on iOS or Key Store in Android, uh, and how we handle the data stored in log files or data cached in memory and so on. And the second one is data in transit. Again, 
the most important thing is end-to-end uh, -end encryption uh, and how we authorize the servers, the certificates that we are using, and whatever secure protocol that we are using for uh, data collection, whether we are using SSL or TLS or SFTP or FTPS, we want to make sure that we use the up-to-date versions and all the uh, best practice configurations. And definitely permissions is another important aspect of mobile applications. We need to make sure that we don't have any unintended permissions on the app. And another very important aspect is code functionality. So that is where you need to uh, make sure that you have defenses against reverse engineering vulnerabilities, for example, root detection, tamper detection, code obfuscation, and all those reverse engineering defenses. And finally, we have APIs. So you might have different APIs using on your app. It might be your own API or coming from some uh, third party. So here you need to make sure that authentication and authorization mechanisms are set up properly and all the defenses uh, uh, regarding the brute force or DDoS attacks and so on. So speaking of the APIs, uh, not only on your app, you need to make sure that you uh, uh, follow the best practices, but it's more uh, uh, a policy regarding your server side. So uh, all these DDoS attacks and so on, it, the major attack surface is on the uh, server side. So that being said, the answer is authentication policies against DDoS attacks, because for the other four options, usually the attack or the defense, we are talking about the mobile side, the local uh, mobile side, but for this one is more a server side thing. So now that we know what is this uh, mobile security attack surface, so we want to start talking about what are the goals based on the, those attack surfaces. So uh, uh, before we start talking about the goals, uh, let's see what do you think, which of the following is not considered as a violation of confidentiality. So for the goals in next slide, we'll see that confidentiality is one of the major crucial components of, of any security and privacy model. So please, again, use the QR code. seconds. All right. Sounds great. So 77% hardware destruction. So let's talk about the security and privacy goals in mobile applications. So here, uh, now let's briefly talk about the uh, CIA triad. And uh, these are the three major uh, crucial uh, components uh, in, in any security and privacy. Uh, uh, model. So we have confidentiality, first of all. Uh, here we may, uh, we, the user, uh, we, we need to make sure that the user who is authorized to receive the data is the one that access the data. On the other side, uh, we have integrity. That means the data should not be modified in the entire life cycle of the uh, data transfer. And, and so it's, we are talking about data in transit and data at rest. And finally, we have availability. So on availability, it means that the system should be available to authorized users at any time that they want to uh, uh, access the system. So we need to make sure that the hardware, OS, and the, uh, uh, the uh, whatever resources we are using is available to the user. So we need all of these three together uh, because we can have a super secure system that satisfies the confidentiality and integrity, but it's not available to anyone. So it, we, need to, we need the system to be available. That's why we need the availability as well. So back to that question, all of the other options, uh, item B and C and D are referring to confidentiality because we are talking about uh, restricting the unauthorized access, uh, but uh, here, 
oops, here we are on hardware destruction, we are talking about more availability. So it's not a uh, violation of confidentiality. Oops, sorry. All right, so now that we know what are the security uh, and privacy uh, uh, attack surface and what are the goals, let's talk about the solutions. So these are the three major methodologies that you can use for penetration testing on mobile applications. Uh, so uh, the first one is OWASP and you can use the other two, but in this particular uh, uh, workshop, we follow the OWASP security guidelines as the open source comprehensive manual uh, for penetration testing on mobile applications. So before I start talking about the uh, OWASP security guidelines, uh, let's go and uh, uh, check out the uh, available options. So for your penetration testing, you can have these companies, you can contract with these companies that will do the uh, penetration testing for you. So these are the major players uh, that will do the penetration testing for mobile applications. But the issue with this solution is that it is very expensive. So the process might, uh, uh, cost you something between $4,000 to $30,000 per penetration testing. And also, uh, it's time consuming. So it will uh, at least take four weeks uh, to make sure that with uh, respect to the criteria that uh, you are following whatever uh, security guidelines to make sure that the uh, uh, criteria is satisfied. So because of that, uh, we uh, here we are talking about an open source uh, approach using the OWASP security guideline to do the penetration testing on mobile healthcare applications. All right, so in terms of the mobile OWASP security guidelines, these are the four major points that needs to be considered uh, during the uh, penetration testing using the OWASP security guidelines. Definitely the first one is setting up the testing environment for your mobile application. The second one is the data storage on mobile apps, how you store the data locally. And the third one is authentication and authorization mechanisms. And finally, we have reverse engineering defenses as we talk about it. So the tamper detection, root detection, and code obfuscation and all those defenses are in this category. So let's start with the first one, which is setting up a security uh, testing environment for your mobile app. Uh, so here, what is important is that you need to be familiar and know what are the options available to the adversaries that use those options against your app. So in other terms, you need to first be an attacker before being able to create a secure app. So these are all the tools and techniques uh, that are uh, available to the uh, attackers uh, from uh, decompiling tools like Dex2Jet or Java decompilers in Android to reverse engineering techniques such as taint analysis, slicing, and so on. So you need to be familiar with all of these uh, techniques and tools uh, to make sure that the defenses that you are using are strong enough against the attackers. So to show that, here we are showing a demo uh, of a sample healthcare app vulnerability. This is a vulnerability in a COVID-19 tracking app that we found uh, by just searching some of the COVID-19 tracking apps. Uh, so to just show you that how we can use a few of this, those tools to find a vulnerability in an app. So this is an, uh, for definitely for privacy reasons, we mask the identity, identity of the app. Uh, but uh, how does it app work is that first of all, it will talk about the privacy protected 100% and the app says that uh, we don't collect the name address or email of you, but the application collects the phone number and how they handle the phone number is not secure. And we'll see that uh, shortly. So here is the privacy policy page and all the consent forms. And here is how the app works. Basically based on the Bluetooth and your location, it will uh, figure it out whether you are close to a COVID-19 positive person and then they can notify you uh, to, uh, and, uh, to decide uh, whether you want to be there or not. So for registration, you need the phone number. After you enter the phone number and you enter the PIN, which is SMS to you, then you're registered. And here is again the consent form 
and the privacy form. So here the application says that the device's phone number is encrypted and never relieved to anyone. So we show that this is not really true and the way that the application handles the phone number is not secure. So again, this is uh, permissions that the application needs to run. And then we have the dashboard of the app where the uh, application notify the users about any risk. So what is the vulnerability here? So we run this app on a rooted device. So because we had a root access, we were able to uh, look at the files which are stored in the application sandbox directory, which is basically data slash data slash the application package uh, directory. If you look at one of these files in the shared preference uh, sandbox of the app, we'll see that they store the phone number unencrypted. So it's in the uh, plain text, there is also a handshake pin uh, stored in plain text and so on. So the application says that they are using encryption for uh, sending the, uh, the phone number. And it's true because we, uh, uh, if you check out the uh, network packets, everything is SSL and it seems that they are doing a great job from that perspective, like doing the encryption and sending the uh, phone number uh, uh, to their server. Uh, but the way that they handle the phone number on the local side and the app, is not secure. So that shows that security is only as good as its weakest link because another malicious app that is that can be run on that uh, rooted environment would be able to look at this file and get the permission and uh, uh, find out the sensitive data which is not authorized to access that. All right, so just to make sure that we are all on the same page and uh, regarding the vulnerability demo that we showed to you. So which of the following vulnerabilities you think was not involved in this sample healthcare app vulnerability? Please again, go ahead and scan the QR code. All right, sorry, I was muted. So uh, going forward, the second uh, important item as we talk about it is the data storage on mobile application. So these are the options that you can store your data locally on the app. Uh, so you can use shared preferences, for example, or SQLite databases or Realm databases or any internal or external storage. So here is an example of using the shared preference to store the data locally on your app. And as you can see, this is not a secure way because we are restoring the uh, username and password in plain text. This is another common uh, example of how we can use SQLite database to store any sort of credential information on the app. So this is again, not a secure way. And we are restoring some sort of uh, credential as in plain text on the app. But here is an example of how we can use a RAM database uh, to store the, uh, securely the data using a key that we can use key store to store the key on Android or uh, for example, keychain on the iOS. So that means that the encryption is the most important thing, uh, but it is not only for data at rest, but for the data in transit, also encryption is the most important uh, thing to consider. So whatever authentication and authorization mechanism that you are using on your app, 
For example, this is the MyPhD dashboard that we are using SFTP for uh, uh, authentication and authorization and using the RSA uh, 3072, uh, which is the recommendation from OWASP. But uh, uh, you need to make sure that uh, every single data in transit is in fully encrypted uh, with respect to the uh, security guideline that you are following up. And finally, we have tampering and reverse engineering on mobile apps. So uh, uh, we were talking about uh, re uh, tamper detection and root detection and code obfuscation. So this is an example of how a reverse engineering attack can happen. So in this thread model, uh, the attacker would download the, your app from App Store and they will get the APK file, for example, in Android or the iOS uh, 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 application file. And then they will decompile the app and uh, get the intermediate representation of your app, for example, Smiley in uh, Android. And uh, over there, they can basically change the logic of your app uh, to uh, whatever uh, the purpose of the attack is. So they can, for example, remove some checkpoints, some security checkpoints of your app, or they can uh, remove the uh, and replace the endpoints with their own server side endpoints. And then they will repackage the app again, uh, the tampered version of the app and sign the app using the private key and then publish the malicious version of the app to the app store or some other public repositories. So if the user download the malicious version of the app, they will, uh, uh, it, it will behave as the attacker wants. So it will send the data to the attacker server instead of the legitimate benign server that your app has been designed. So here we are, uh, again, with respect to the OWASP security guideline, uh, we are showing a demo of how you can use mobile security framework to do the penetration testing with respect to OWASP uh, security guideline. This is the uh, mobile security framework that we use for penetration testing on my PhD as well. So if you check out the GitHub, uh, you can find out great uh, documentation on what are the requirements for static and dynamic analysis and how you can install the tool. And then uh, you can run the tool on your machine. And if you look at the uh, local host of your uh, machine, you can upload the uh, APK file of your Android app or even the iOS app. And then it will show you all the details of your app, the, the security score, the, all the components like the activities, uh, uh, services, receivers, and providers, which are the four major components in Android. Uh, and uh, what are the list of the, uh, it will also show you the uh, list of the SMALI code. And you can also run a, a dynamic analysis uh, using the uh, mobile self penetration testing tool. Also, it will show you the status of the uh, certificate, whether you're using a, a, a proper certificate or not. And then uh, it will also show you the permissions that you're using on your app. Uh, so if there is any dangerous permission that you're using, it will uh, raise a flag for you. And the code analysis, again, here is a, is a result of a static analysis. That's where it shows the all the potential vulnerabilities in your app. And another good thing is that if you have any security uh, defense, uh, it will catch that uh, policy or whatever mechanism that you're using with high probability and it will uh, raise a secure flag for that. For example, in my PhD, we have several root detection mechanisms. And uh, again, it will check for the domains and check the status, whether you are using a proper ones or not. So we talk about the penetration testing tools and static and dynamic analysis. Now let's uh, take a quick look at how these penetration testing tools work. Uh, so in next three slides, we'll talk about this uh, program static and dynamic analysis in program languages. So first of all, consider that you have the program like this and you can create the program flow from your program, which each node is representing the uh, one line of code in your program. 
and then we have the flow of your program starting from here and then we have one uh, node number one and two and here we have a branch node or a decision point and then we have a while loop here and finally we have the exit edge over here so from this program flow we can create a program dependence graph or pdg which contains the same exact same nodes as in program flow, but we have two types of edges. One is control flow edge and the other one is data flow edge. So speaking of the data flow edge, for example, simply we have uh, the variable X has been defined here. And then this value of five is transferred to this, to this use of X. So from a use to this definition, we have a data flow. That's why we, we have a data flow edge from node number two to number one. And on the other hand, with respect to the control flow edge, here we have a branch node. This node basically determines and decides whether any of these nodes need to be, should be executed or not. So because of that, the execution of node number four and five depends on node number three. So that's why we have uh, control flow edges from these two guys to node number three. So the static analysis is uh, useful because it will look at the all the possible paths in your program. So if you have a program dependence graph like this, it will look at all the possible scenarios here. So it has a global view of your program. And uh, But on the other side, because it, it is considering all the possible uh, scenarios, uh, it has a false positives because uh, uh, the, some of the scenarios actually might not be uh, executed in real world application. On the other side, the dynamic analysis is looking at a specific execution of your program. For example, you can start from, uh, this is an example execution trace, that in this trace, we start from a statement one and uh, going forward. And here, for example, a statement number seven has not been executed. That's why we don't have it in our analysis. And here, the good thing is that because it's a, a dynamic analysis, uh, you are running the, uh, uh, the program for, uh, with respect to a specific criteria and a specific execution. So uh, you can bring more information to your analysis as you're running the program. So it's more accurate uh, result. But on the other side, because you're looking to some specific executions, it might introduce some false negatives. So it might uh, miss some cases. So that is the reason that you need both of these analysis together to have a, a let's say, a sound and complete analysis uh, for your, uh, uh, basically, whatever penetration testing uh, that is used these analysis. And finally, we have this uh, penetration testing result for my PhD. So this is the result that we got based on the uh, running the uh, mo uh, mobile security framework penetration testing on my PhD. So we got a score of 10 out of 100. And we got a lot of flags uh, from high to medium to warnings. And uh, these are just a small set of them. And we resolved the uh, flags and uh, with respect to again the OVAS security guidelines one by one by one and uh, finally once we run it again uh, we uh, the penetration testing on my PhD the security score we got 95 out of 100 so this is before and this is after and at the end I want to say a special thanks to Elizabeth Lee, the senior privacy officer, and Tad Perillo, the senior security officer, for the great, great support on this uh, penetration testing and the identification risks uh, project. And also Dr. Mike Snyder, our PI, special thanks to him, and to all the great uh, lab members at the Snyder Lab. Just a question here. So here, if you have any questions, I would be happy to uh, answer. So it looks like we have a few questions on the chat. Um, let's take a look, a question from, uh, from Ray. Uh, do these tools such as uh, MobSF also work on iPhone apps or are these strictly for the Android apps? So the MobSF specifically work, works with both. 
you can run static and dynamic analysis on both Android and iOS. All right. Uh, does the MyPhD app uh, also work on the iPhone? Yes. So my PhD has both iPhone and Android versions. And uh, we have a question here from Bruce. What was the other 5%? Uh, oh, I, I suppose that's the, the, you got a 95 out of 100. So there was still about a 5% there. That's a very good question. So that's definitely for security and privacy reasons. We cannot talk about the details. But uh, that is coming from the static analysis part, which is definitely a, a, a false positive based on our analysis and research. So that is something that is related to the functionality of the app. And we cannot remove such a condition, but it is coming from the static analysis. So many of these apps, you will deal with many of these kind of false positives in, in during the analysis. Yeah, static analysis generally generates a lot of false positives and uh, difficult to uh, to get 100%. Uh, okay, so we have a question here from, from Lee. Uh, what is the guidelines to store data safely in an external storage? Uh, maybe I can answer that one. Uh, encryption, uh, make sure that your external storage is always encrypted and uh, you should be uh, pretty safe with that one. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a I question. Can, I can add from the privacy. I would say if you're going to st store it externally, you want to learn look at the terms of use to see if that external storage will allow for the third party to access your data. So th those are things to consider. Uh, things that are free are not always free. So uh, one last question here from uh, Arash. Uh, can you share a list of useful links related to the security stuff? Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So uh, if we can have your email address or email us, we can definitely send you the links. All right, great. So uh, I think uh, it was a fantastic presentation, uh, Arash and Amir. Thank you very much for being so generous with your knowledge and uh, sharing that with the rest of us.